Good morning. Could we just say Happy Dad's Day to all the dads and how much we appreciate the work they do? Uh, you've probably heard the term guy, right? And some people think that just refers to the male of the species. It's often used to describe the male of the species, but its origins actually comes from something quite different. Uh, a guy wire, it's not a guide wire, a guy wire is something that they use for tall antennas, or they used to use them on ships, and it was a wire that was strong, supportive, and stable. So when someone calls you a guy, they're saying you're strong, you're supportive, and you're stable. So how many are glad for all the strong, supportive, stable people we have at Calvary today? Yeah. So which travels faster, good news or bad news? <laughs> yeah, the, the correct answer is bad news. Uh, today also marks something called June, Juneteenth. And if you don't know what that is, actually, in um, January 1st, 1863, was the Emancipation and Proclamation uh, declaring all slavery to be over in the United States of America. Uh, June 19th, 1965 was when that finally made its way to the final places where slavery existed. Two and a half years of good news, but it took that long to get somewhere. And uh, I hope you realize that freedom, while it may be prized by a nation, is not the gift of a nation. It's a gift from God, and it's his desire for all of his children. How many are grateful for the freedom that God has granted to you and the freedom that he grants to everyone else? Amen? Amen. So we're in a series called Out of the Shallows. And the reason we're in this series is because we don't just want to live a shallow life or a shallow faith life. And actually, there's a strong correlation between shallow and hollow. I don't think any of us want that. So we're in this series. And, and in the first week, we talked about how that God invites us into life with him, but we also have to invite God into our life. It's, there's a two-way invitation. And the second week, we looked at the spiritual life. Sarah gave this message. Spiritual life is not just an experience with God, but it's a response to God. And then the third week, we discovered that we can't really go deeper alone. It requires community. We're in this together. And then the fourth week, we talked about how that the Holy Spirit comes to make us more like Jesus, not just a better version of ourselves. And uh, last week, uh, Jonathan spoke, and, and he talked about how we can go deeper in prayer. What I want to talk to you today about is decision-making. How many would like to improve your capacity for decision-making? How many think your decision-making is good just the way it is? How many is living with someone who thinks their decision-making is good just the way it is? Yeah. Here's what I'd like you to think about as we head into this. I think it's a lot less difficult to believe in God than it is to trust God. Most people actually believe in God. But that doesn't mean that they trust him. The Holy Spirit comes to help us trust God more deeply. And the way that shows up is in our decision making. We're in Romans the eighth chapter. By the way, Romans eight has been kind of a, a landing ground for a lot of these talks. And Romans the eighth chapter, beginning in verse 12, it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we do have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of your body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God, that's a really interesting phrase, isn't it? Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. This Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are his children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, 
co-heirs with Christ, and if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. If you were offered two jobs, how would you decide which job you would take? And for lots of people, the only question is, which pays more? If you had a good job where you are, how much money would it take to relocate you and your family to another part of the country? See, Paul talks about an obligation, it's strong language. But our obligation is not just to do what we always want, it's to try as best we can to discern what God wants in a situation and act consistently with that. And so if all we do is make decisions based on economics, then we're not really making a decision. It's already been made for us. I can make you do anything just by offering you more money than you have right now. And what scripture tells us is that's not a great way to make decisions in your life. Uh, we might want to experience pleasure. We might want to experience comfort, but those things can't be the only criteria for our lives. Maybe we want to be considered better in life than some other people. Maybe we want to feel more secure about our lives and our future. But that cannot become the only criteria by which we make decisions. Most people want to make a good decision, but the question is, so what qualifies as a good decision? And some people would say, well, as long as I don't do something illegal, unethical, or stupid. Well, uh, I think that we shouldn't do illegal, unethical, and stupid things. Anybody agree with that? You're starting to worry me just a little bit, okay? But is that the criteria for decision making? It's not illegal, it's not unethical, it's not stupid, so go for it? Hmm. I've got another question for you. Uh, what decisions have the greater impact on your life? Big decisions or small decisions? Hmm. It's not obvious because sometimes a small decision can have a huge influence over time. Or a small decision that we make multiple times a day. The simple truth is this, who you are today and where you are today is a result of the decisions you have made. Maybe you're happy about that, and if so, I'm glad. And maybe you're not happy about that, and if so, then I think there could be a lot of information in today's talk that will help you. There's more to decision-making than just rule following. Some people think that, that all decision-making is is just following the rules, just find out what the rules are that God has given to us and apply them as best we can to our life. And then there are some people who might claim they have an inside track to spiritual information and they need to be consulted before you can know what to do in your life. And, and certainly there are people who have wisdom, there are people who have experience, there are people who are sensitive to the promptings of the Spirit of God. But if we abdicate all of our decision-making to someone else who we perceive as being more spiritual than us, that can actually lead to a form of spiritual abuse. The Holy Spirit has come to help guide us in our decision-making. And notice that word, guide. The Holy Spirit helps us make decisions. He does not take decision-making away from us. You need to be able to make decisions. In fact, this is what I would say. You cannot become a mature person if you don't learn to make decisions in your life. The prime, in fact, I will say this. The primary process of maturity is decision-making. And the primary process of assessing your maturity is by assessing the decisions you make. We become mature by making decisions and we prove our maturity by the decisions that we make. Now in the Bible, we see lots of examples of how the Holy Spirit might help someone. Sometimes it was in dreams, sometimes it was in visions, sometimes it was in signs. Jesus, after he was baptized, said he was led by the Spirit into the desert. What does that mean? 
Uh, the Apostle Paul would frequently use a phrase about being led by the Spirit. What, what is he talking about? How are we led by the Spirit? And have you ever felt like that has happened in your life? Now, some people, what they want from God is a detailed map. Does anybody use some kind of guidance mechanism when you're traveling besides me? Yes. And uh, I plug in uh, the information where I want to go, and then I do what it tells me. And it'll, it'll tell me. It'll even give me a, a heads-up warning. In two miles, you will be exiting on exit 25. And then I get there. When I get there, like at a half mile, in a half mile, you exit. And it'll tell me, you need to be in the right lane right now. And then, and then I, I get off. And it, it, never, it never congratulates me for doing the right thing. <laughs> One time I ignored it, and I thought I heard it sigh. I thought, <sighs> okay. This is what people, some people want from God. On this day, go to this place, turn right, stand still for 30 seconds, go north. Is that really decision making? And what level of decision making should God be providing for you? Should you get divine direction on what color car to buy or what color shirt to wear or what color to paint the house? Now, I have seen some colors that I was pretty sure God had no input in at all, but that could just be me. Here's the thing that might surprise you is that God actually incorporates freedom into his guidance. I can remember asking God uh, for direction on something and feeling as though God whispered back to me, what would you like? And there are some people whose spirituality never allow for that kind of freedom. That there's any freedom would, would be frustrating to them. Lots of people would prefer a detailed list to a guided life. We would rather have instructions than use our imagination. What if there's a way to combine common sense and imagination and inspiration and conscience and spiritual sensitivity and community to discern God's will for our life and then make decisions accordingly? And lots of people go, that sounds hard. And it's not nearly as hard as we think it is, and certainly not as hard as trying to work our way past a bunch of bad decisions that we have made. And a lot of times, decisions aren't just knowing what to do, but how to do something. How are we supposed to serve others? How are we supposed to love others? How are we supposed to speak the truth in love? That matters a lot. So there are lots of ways that the Holy Spirit does help us. I'm going to talk about two of the more common ways because I think they're the ones you're going to bump into more frequently. And the first is this, the Holy Spirit may affirm his du direction through peace. The Holy Spirit may affirm his direction through peace peace. Now, peace is not actually determined by our circumstances. If your peace is completely determined by your circumstances, then all I have to do is adjust your circumstances and I can influence your inner experience. Uh, it's not the same thing as feeling pleasure. It's not the same thing as feeling happy. Peace is a sense, I'm going to try to give you two concepts that I think will help you understand this. Peace is a sense of life and a sense of purpose. You feel like you're alive and you have a sense of purpose. And when those two things are true, that feeling is a biblical concept of peace. So you can actually be going through some pretty hard things, but you feel like you're alive and you feel like you've got a purpose. That could well be the peace of God. Now, it doesn't mean 
that if we're looking to be led by peace, that God will only lead us into situations that are comfortable or that always work the way that we want them to. It's possible to experience peace in the midst of incredibly difficult circumstances, situations, and seasons in our life. This peace from God reminds us that God is with us and that God will provide for us. The Holy Spirit can bring this calm assurance and quiet confidence even when there's a lot going on around you. We should pay attention to that. Uh, let me give you an example from Scripture. It's in 2 Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul telling this part of the story. And he says, When I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, what did he find? The Lord opened a door for me. I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. What? The Lord opened a door? And he didn't have peace of mind. So he said goodbye and went someplace else. Opportunity does not mean obligation. Opportunity does not mean obligation. There was a wide open door of opportunity. But Paul did not consider this the only criteria by which to make a decision. Oh, look. An opportunity. I guess this is what I'm supposed to do. He had another criteria to assess that with. And so he recognized there was no peace of mind. And he recognized why that peace of mind was not there. And so he moves on. Paul's lack of peace caused him to consider other options. We should think about that. Something was not right. Something was out of place. We have, by the way, it's good to learn the difference between peace and false peace. Peace is not just trying to escape something that's uncomfortable. It's not just trying to escape some kind of suffering. It's not just trying to escape a bad situation. Peace actually leans into our convictions, not just away from conflict. False peace is always trying to avoid conflict. Real peace has an inner calm assurance and quiet confidence that sometimes requires you to deal with conflict. Now, I wish I could tell you that if you're spirit-led, you will never have a negative experience. Let's suppose God tells you to take a job. You've prayed about it. You've sought his will. You have an inner peace. It seems like the right thing to do. And so you take the job and then you get there. And you could assume that because God directed you there, all you're going to get is promotions, positive reviews, increases in compensation, and lots more benefits and vacation time. Hallelujah. I'm in the will of God. I'm going to get all this stuff. And let's say you get there, and they downsize, and they cut off some of your benefits, and you go, what happened? Maybe I misunderstood the will of God. No, you misunderstand how the will of God works. Maybe what he needs is a believer in the midst of all of that chaos that can be a light that shines for the gospel of Christ to people who are really struggling. Would that be enough for you? It's an interesting question to try to sort out. Following God's will does not necessarily make life easier. It makes life better. And the number of times those two things aren't the same thing is a lot more than we want to admit. I'll give you a little example. By the way, I do apologize because I don't know where I am time-wise this morning. I forgot to turn on my little stopwatch. And so, when I came to serve at Calvary Assembly, I was actually offered a lead pastor role in Maryland to a, to a church of over 800 people and a brand new building. 
I was also offered to be the lead pastor of a church in Rochester of less than 20 people and a dilapidated building. If the will of God was always choosing the easy thing, I clearly did not choose the will of God. But look what God has done. Is that not worth something? We should think about these things. So, well, what if I make a bad decision? I've got very good news for you. First of all, how many are willing to admit you've made at least one bad decision in your life? If your hand's not up, that was the most recent one. Just <laughs> made a bad decision right there. Um, a bad decision will not eliminate God's purpose for your life. In the midst of that bad decision, God can actually redirect you and over time get you back right on track where he wants you to be. God can actually use a bad decision to te teach us valuable lessons. The greatest enemy of our spiritual life is not a poor decision, it's apathy. You can do more damage to your spiritual life through apathy than a poor decision. So, how do you grow in your ability to make decisions? Well, I recommend you think about a decision before you make it, and then you act on it when you make it, and then after you've acted on a decision, think about it some more, reflect on it. Like, how did that go? It's amazing how many people seem to make the same decision over and over, even though it doesn't serve them as well as they would want. This is what I can tell you about Holy Spirit decision-making or guidance, and that is it will not contradict God's Word, and it will not contradict God's Son, which means that a decision that you're making, if one of the options, Scripture says it's wrong, God's not going to change his mind about that. And if it violates the example of Jesus' Son, that's not likely to be God's will for your life. Now, the Holy Spirit may confirm his direction through Peace, he can also affirm his direction through consensus. I know, that's, <laughs> we're not even sure what that is anymore. What's consensus? As Christianity was spreading in the early church, Gentiles started becoming Christians, and an argument rose up because there was an assumption by some people that if you were going to be a Christian, you had to become Jewish first, which meant that you had to submit to the right of circumcision if you were male. And, uh, and, and the, uh, the Apostle Paul and others who were leading the evangelistic efforts among Gentiles knew that that was going to be a rate-limiting step. There's a lot of guys that go, yeah, I'm not doing that. And so it became a source of contention. And Paul and Barnabas and some of the elders came back to Jerusalem, and they met with lots of spiritual elders and leaders in the church. And they had, you ready for this? They had... You're not going to believe this. They had a conversation. They didn't all walk in with the same view. And when they heard somebody else's view that was different, they didn't try to dominate them or destroy them. If you're in domination mode, you have abandoned the Holy Spirit's direction in your life. That's not how he works. When people came, they were welcomed. When they shared, they were able to share their views directly. They were able to share them honestly. They were able to share them, and they were treated respectfully. And after a lot of conversation, James, one of the leaders in the church, comes up with an option to consider, and he puts it out there. And when everybody heard the option, they all agreed this was a good deal. You can read about it in Acts chapter 15. And this is what the, their final consensus was, that for a Gentile to become a follower of Jesus, they did not have to become Jewish first and follow all the traditions of the Jews. The, the things that they basically asked them not to do is not to engage in sexual immorality and not to eat food that's been offered to idols. Other than that, you are, you are fully fledged, accepted, and equal to us in every way in following Jesus. And this is what it says in the 20, I think it's the 28th verse of that chapter. It says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Who got their way that day? The Holy Spirit.
That's what made it a really good decision. So, um, so what is what is required? Let's let's think about this. Decision making doesn't require you to dominate someone else, and it doesn't require you to abdicate to someone else. None of that will help you. When you're looking to uh, follow the direction of God or discover and discern the direction of God in your life, there's some things that I will recommend for you, four simple things, and I'll end with this uh, today. One, invite God to be with you in the process. Invite God to be with you in the process. Don't try to sort it all out and then go to him and ask his blessing after the fact. Help, help me sort this out. Our goal is faithfulness to God, not trying to convince God. Secondly, identify what specific decision needs to be made. Like in, a, in, in our church, every once in a while, there'll be some folks that come to talk to me, and at the end of the day, they've got lots of interest, lots of ideas, lots of energy. That's all good. I applaud it. I support it all. But sometimes I have to ask, so what is it that you are asking me to do? Because that would be useful for me to know. And if they've thought it through, they have a clear idea about that. And if they haven't thought it through, they're unsure about that. So what you can do is as you th think of more than one option, Everyone here is, is bright. You can think of more than one option in the decision. Well, I can do it or not do it. That's two options. You can think of more than two options. There's lots of things to consider. And capture as many options as you possibly can. And include any thoughts that you can possibly about that. And then what I want you to do is number three, is imagine the different options one at a time over time. So you take one of those options, and I'd like you to pray about it. Invite God and then imagine, use your imagination, imagine you walking through that option. Sometimes it's good to take more than just a couple minutes about this. Could be a better part of a day. And you think about what that option would look like and then pay attention. Do you have that sense of you're coming alive and there's a sense of God's purpose, that God is with you, that God is for you? Or do you feel anxiety starting to rise? Pay attention to that. That's worth knowing. Then make a decision. Your life will not prove the will of God by failing or refusing to make a decision. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. When we wanted to expand our facilities, some people think that all pastors want to build buildings. I do not. Um, I actually don't think this facility is the church. I think the people who attend are the church. This is just a facility that facilitates ministry. And our church council got together and for months we prayed trying to discern God's will, and lots of conversations. And we came to a consensus, and the church council asked me to lead a capital campaign. And so what did I do? Did I go out and declare the will of God to everyone in the church? I did not. We started meeting with other elders, other leaders, couples, small groups, medium-sized groups, volunteers brought everyone into the conversation. There actually came a moment when we brought the decision to our church family. Do we move forward on this? Do we not move forward on this? And I will tell you, there's no shortage of voices that will say, if you take a path like that, you could miss the will of God. What I will tell you is you can do the will of God in the wrong way and get to a worse place than you could possibly have imagined. I think if a decision involves other adults, it makes sense to bring other adults into the decision, doesn't it? That's good marriage counsel, in case you're interested. Stop trying to make decisions for your spouse. Bring them into the conversation. If it affects them, 
Let's have a conversation. And then something happens. You're not going to be perfect at decision making. But in the process, you're going to feel like you're starting to discern something. And in that discernment, it'll feel like something's coming alive in you. And that you're not just wandering. There's a sense of purpose about the way you're directing your steps, the actions that you're taking. And sometimes you'll have other wise and discerning people come alongside and, and they'll affirm, I, I can see God at work in this. That peace and that consensus adds to our capacity to walk with confidence. And that is what God wants for you. Christianity is not a bunch of insecure people hoping they don't get it wrong. Christianity is about a people who are growing and maturing and learning to walk in confidence in the ways that God has called them to. That's what he has for you. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, help us invite you into the process. Help us identify what decision needs to be made. Help us consider multiple options. Help us imagine how we're working our way through them and help us discern the inner work you are doing through all of that. Lead us. We are your people. We don't just believe in you. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.